Born in England in 1880, occultist Alice Bailey was a powerful influence in promoting the philosophy that would eventually, 100 years later, form the foundation of the New Age movement. Today, these same religious ideas and practices are transforming before our eyes into the new Christianized spirituality, which is spreading like wildfire throughout evangelical churches. Bailey's blend of mysticism fused several aspects of Christianity with the religious teachings of another 19th century occultist, Madame Blavatsky, who founded Theosophy. Bailey called her metaphysical philosophy ageless wisdom, in which she promoted esoteric ideas like the age of Aquarius, astrology, spiritual psychology, spirit healings, and Eastern meditation, along with the idea that spirituality relates to the solar system, the destiny of nations, and society at large. Bailey claimed her writings were telepathically dictated to her by her spirit guide, Master of the Wisdom, who she called the Tibetan, or Jual Kul, who used her as a channel to spread supernatural messages. While under this entity's possession, she stated, the new age is upon us, and we are witnessing the birth pangs of the new culture and the new civilization. This is now in progress. That which is old and undesirable must go. The spirit has gone out of the old faiths, and the true spiritual light is transferring itself into a new form which will manifest on earth eventually as the new world religion. Many evangelical leaders in the church today have unknowingly taken it upon themselves to further Alice Bailey's esoteric teachings and are calling for changes in so-called old-fashioned Christianity, traditional faith, and undesirable churchianity. This might sound like a noble concept, but at its core is an ominous rejection of the Creator God that the Almighty God of the Bible just didn't anticipate present-day conditions or the needs of this 21st century generation. With such presumption comes the idea that we, the people, are going to usurp God's authority, take over His role, and rethink, redesign, and reinvent biblical Christianity, and usher in a Christianized, all-embracing, new spirituality. I'm Carol Matriciana, author and filmmaker. I was born and raised in India for almost 20 years of my life and lived in a rich culture with many diverse religions. There was Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Islam, and I learned at the time, and my ongoing research has brought me to understand that there are really basically only two worldviews. The Eastern mysticism of Hinduism teaches that man is innately good, that we are in fact divinity, that all is deity, that we are part of a oneness, um, a global God consciousness, if you will. Whereas the biblical worldview, the only other worldview that exists, says that God is outside of his creation, outside of humankind, that he is separated, he is holy, he is righteous, and man is a sinner, and we are separated by our sin from God. Eastern mysticism, however, teaches that what separates us from God is our ignorance of knowing our own internal divinity 
in Eastern mysticism, the power of Eastern spirituality believes in the serpent as its spiritual wisdom. Knowledge comes from the serpent who is seen to be divine. Around Shiva, the god of Hinduism, you'll see the serpent coiled around his neck, around his arms. And this idea of serpent knowledge, kundalini power, is believed to be inside everybody and needs to be awakened through spiritual disciplines. This Eastern spiritual idea came into the West in the 60s um, in basically through the drug culture, I'd say, where the idea of awareness expanded consciousness, altered states of consciousness. And at the same time, Western society was inviting God men, the religious leaders of India, and celebrities like the Beatles invited Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of Transcendental Meditation. There was Sai Baba, there was Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, Yogi Bhajan, all these various different God men invaded the West and with them brought their Eastern spirituality, teaching us that we could connect to our godness, our divinity, if you will, through spiritual exercises, various different types of yoga, various different types of Eastern meditation. And at the base of it all was the innate idea that we were good and that we could connect to God through awakening the snake power in us that would awaken our consciousness to our oneness with divinity. In the 80s, this idea started coming into the churches. We saw it in Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral, the idea of positive imaging coming through Norman Vincent Peale, Robert Schuller's mentor, that said we could, through positive visualization and stimulation of our senses, we could connect, if you will, with our God potential. Um, but this was always seen as the fringes, in a way, out there. But slowly, this idea started coming more and more into evangelical thinking, um, particularly through leaders like Richard Foster with his classic, incredibly urgent, important book, uh, Celebration of Discipline, that promoted the spiritual disciplines called contemplative meditation, contemplative prayer but based in Eastern spirituality. And this was further fanned through uh, Roman Catholic monks and priests like Henry Nouwen that brought in the idea of Eastern mysticism now being able to be called Christian mysticism, given Christian terminology. In the 80s, there was also a legitimizing of Eastern mysticism through what was called science and it came in as psychology into the churches. It also came into mainstream society, but touching on the fringe aspects of churches through holistic medicine, alternative medicine, the idea of mind, body, spirit, being able to be treated through the metaphysical so that one could through Christian yoga, through Christian meditation, through biofeedback and other ideas that were rooted in Eastern thinking, that we could become well if we connected with metaphysical spirituality. So by the turn of the century, this was just rampant in the evangelical church as well, coming through a movement called the Emerging New Christianity where those that had been raised as Christians and evangelicals were promoting mystical thinking through evangelical terminology, through biblical terminology. And uh, these neo-evangelicals, liberal Christians, if you will, were bringing in the idea of the social gospel, good works, uniting with people of all faiths, pushing forward the idea that we could all together unite and have a better utopia world Gone was the idea that the Bible was the authority, the reliable truth, the inspiration of God, and that salvation, faith, and belief in Jesus Christ was now being overturned by a new age gospel that we could all come together and bring in utopia and heaven. Well, in the 60s, when I was a new ager, we understood this was Eastern mystical thinking. But uh, now it's come into the church repackaged as new spirituality, promoting a new gospel, um, a new Christianity, but it's still the old lie rooted in the Garden of Eden where the serpent, the snake, offered Eve wisdom through her own reasoning and through their conversation persuaded her and deceived her. What was called New Age got exposed fairly well in the 1980s and the early 1990s, so it morphed into 
the new gospel, the new spirituality. Uh, I'm watching now as this so-called emerging church is now saying that that label is no longer valid. And lo and behold, the term that they've come up with, the new spirituality, dovetails completely with what the new age is calling itself. And I look at the emerging church as the merging church. It's merging into the world. It's merging into the new age that I was once a part of. It's merging into false beliefs and false philosophies. Most people are familiar with the terms of seeker sensitive and uh, emergent, uh, contemplative. There's any number of, uh, of labels and tags. As soon as you're kind of able to define them, then they like to call themselves something else. It changes seemingly almost by the day. Uh, it's always, if you will, evolving, which you would kind of expect to be the case. When there's no absolutes, you keep moving as you, as you explore the depths of what it is that you believe, and that's where we see them going. Experiences based on emotional and volitional processes can lead to deception because they appear to be based on reality, but we've got nothing to measure our reality against. God desires we have a relationship with him based on the biblical understanding that we can use our cognitive knowledge and discernment, look into the scriptures to examine his character and know him based on the fact that he is truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So on the truth of the word, um, our experience can be weighed, whereas if we have a volitional, emotional experience, that can open itself up to deception uh, based on just my feelings and the feelings of other people that are based on their feelings. In Jeremiah 9, God encourages us to understand him and know him, to discern his character, to study his character based on the authority and reliability of the word. And they quit looking at the Bible as authoritative, make it up as they go. It gives rise to any number of aberrant spiritual practices, prayer practices, ways that they come to an understanding of what is truth. Where is it found? How is it found? Is it experiential? In an attempt to make the church more relevant today, to reach out to what's called the postmodern generation, there are many church leaders who say we need to reinvent Christianity to find a form of Christianity that will be acceptable to this generation. Now one of the things that they're looking for is to provide the kinds of experiences that would attract particularly young people into Christianity. The core premise of postmodern philosophy is the idea that truth is subjective and therefore relative. Uh, they, in postmodern philosophy they talk about a social construction of reality. And what that means is that for the postmodern mind uh, truth is simply created by social consensus, by people groups agreeing with one another on what they believe is true. So there is no universal, absolute, timeless truth. Truth then is simply subjective and therefore relative. These groups can come together and agree upon truth, but they have to leave what they used to believe in order to come to that agreement. It's the natural outcome that you would have when the Bible's no longer the authority, because there's nothing that moors your, your truth. Jesus said to us that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, how do you know that? How can you understand what that truth is? How do we even know who Jesus is if not for the fact that he's revealed in his word? So where does truth come from? Where does it have its origins? Who's the author of truth? In these groups, it's man who defines and decides what is actually truth. As soon as you say there is no absolute, universal, timeless, objective truth, and then you bring that philosophy into Christianity, well, that's going to have significant implications for uh, your faith as a Christian. In the postmodern mindset, you can't, uh, you can't believe any interpretation from the scriptures. So when the Word of God clearly says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, um, evangelicals say this is true. We are all sinners. But to the postmodern mind, um, they what they'll claim is that you can't know what that scripture verse says or any other scripture. The doctrine of original sin doesn't fit with our postmodern view of scripture or the gospel, and so what we need to do is disregard it and then redefine this idea of the gospel to fit our postmodern understanding. We've reached
reached a turning point in the church where now the evangelical church, conservative Christians, traditional Christianity is embracing the Eastern mystical worldview, the idea that we can somehow connect to God through an experience. This is seen in such a real way in uh, Rick Warren's Daniel plan, and he invited three expert doctors of three varying faiths, one a Muslim, one a Jew, one a mystic Christian, all believe in holistic medicine, the idea of body, mind, spirit, being able to be healed through metaphysical spirituality. And these men promote between the three of them transcendental meditation, Japanese Reiki healing, Kirtan Kriya Yoga, a hodgepodge of Eastern ideas that Eastern mysticism claims as part of holistic healing. Pastor Rick Warren has been called by Time magazine as America's pastor. He is pastor of the eighth largest church in America, has 22,000 people in his congregation, not counting the 40,000 pastors that are connected to Saddleback, his church, through his purpose-driven movement. So Rick Warren has a huge influence. In fact, Time magazine said that he was second only to Billy Graham in being uh, the top influential evangelicals in America. So here is somebody that should be preaching from the Bible, should be preaching in a way or teaching in a way that is called expository teaching, where it's line by line, verse by verse, um, book by book with the Bible but he has now embraced, as have all these emerging churches and mega churches and seeker-friendly churches, the idea of thematic preaching that is on a topic and they can draw from all sources to substantiate the topic they're teaching on. Maybe they can pull one or two Bible verses to just make it sound Christian, be Christian, etc. But William Shakespeare, Gandhi, uh, any well-known person that uh, that, that in any way tends to support the thinking of this topic uh, can be part of the message. So Christians today it, being raised in these churches do not have a full understanding of the gospel in all its full entirety. They have no discernment, uh, no sword of truth able to discern and check out false teachers doctrines of deception, lying and seducing doctrines, and that's what we're told to do in the Bible. In the end times, Paul said that the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because they checked everything he taught against Scripture daily. Well, today's Christians can't do that, and so they're open to apostasy because they don't know how to test truth. My involvement with Saddleback Church, Rick Warren's church, started in the early 19. 90s and uh, every Sunday from 97 to about 2006 I was really involved in those years loved Rick Warren's church loved the feel-good atmosphere it was a beautiful campus um, I loved the way you'd be able to go dress casually and um, never carried a Bible to his church well I did get a Bible at that time but I didn't need it. These emergent churches, uh, if we want to call them emergence, or, or the new spirituality, maybe a better way of putting it, these are people who reject the notion that absolute truth can be defined as far as the Bible is concerned. Um, I guess I would put it this way, that, that they want God to fit their sensibilities. They're offended by the God that they see represented in the Bible if you take it as literal truth. One of the common concerns that we hear is, well, don't you think that Christianity changes? Do you think that it remains the same as it was 2,000 years ago? Uh, what about cultural relevance? You know, do you think that your Christianity is the only true Christianity? There's nothing that needs to be redefined. There's nothing wrong with what we have in front of us as far as Scripture is concerned. Because ultimately, if we take man's philosophy and it runs headlong into what the Scripture teaches, who are we to believe? If God, as we view it, took the time and the trouble to write it, are we going to believe those who look to rewrite its truths? If I could uh, give a couple of principles or characteristics of this emerging movement, it denies the authority of God's Word, it denies the clarity of God's Word, it denies that God's Word is infallible or inerrant, and it tries to displace 
the objective truth of God's Word with subjectivism. For the nine years that I was a part of Rick Warren's church on Sunday services, it was about going in and being handed sermon notes. And those are what we were taught by. And for me, it was what I, was, I would use instead of the Bible. One thing about his church, though, the way he taught in his sermon notes didn't coincide with the Word of God. I was never able to discern the truth from the teaching of Rick Warren until I was able to uh, open up a Bible and started reading the Word and um, started being able to define what God's Word said compared to the teachings of Rick Warren at Saddleback Church. And um, for me, my eyes were open to being deceived. The biggest problem in the postmodern arena starts in the area of what's called epistemology, and it's just a fancy word that means the study of knowledge, okay? And what's happened in the postmodern generation is they've given up on the idea that they can know anything. They don't have access to truth or reality. And because they can't know, um, in other words, they have bad epistemology, they also end up having bad theology or an understanding of God because they can't know him from his word. And if you can't know God uh, from his word, well, then the only way you can know about him is through Eastern mystical practices. Eastern mystical practices are now being used in the evangelical church. I, as a Roman Catholic, longed to have a connection with God, which for me in my Catholic mystical practices came through my touching the beads of the rosary, uh, repeating prayers. This was the way that I could connect to God by coming into the church, making the sign of the cross with the holy water. This was my connection into God by walking around the church doing the stations of the cross, which in the evangelical church today is called labyrinth walking. This would be my connection to God. So through these practices, I could connect into what I thought was the presence of God. But this is now coming into the evangelical church in all sorts of methodology being practiced when truly the Bible is the only way that God wants us to connect to him through the truths of the Bible. We connect to God through what Jesus has done on the cross and are reconciled as sinners, Jesus having taken our penalty. That's the point of it, our eternal salvation. And when you don't have the word of God, you do feel disconnected. You, I mean, what do we rely on? And so I can quite understand how these practices are coming into the evangelical church, but they're not based on biblical Christianity. Within the emergent church, because they have thrown out the idea of absolute objective truth, the idea that we can open up God's word and discern his timeless universal truth to humanity, what has happened is they've basically exchanged a rational Christianity for a irrational Christianity which is based on human subjective emotional experiences. We have to be really careful about thinking that anything that's coming to us is from God and obviously the warnings in the Bible about seductive spirits, about deception, about testing the spirits. They're written to believers that we need to test these things. The ancient future movement is also part of what's called the emerging church. The view is, is that traditional Christianity is too legalistic, too dry. The uh, seeker-friendly movement is too superficial, too entertainment-oriented, and people from emerging generations, those under 35, want a more profound encounter with God, so therefore they're looking back to the ancient uh, time period of the Desert Fathers in the Middle Ages, especially to mystics of that era, to revitalize their Christian faith. One aspect of uh, appealing to the postmodern generation is to introduce techniques, spirituality, litanies, rituals, and so on. This is called vintage Christianity or ancient future Christianity. Let's go back to the disciplines of the monks. Let's introduce some of the ideas of the East from yoga. We'll have this form of Christianity that all people can embrace. Yoga, 2,000 year old pagan religious philosophy, uh, which is now widespread throughout the emergent church movement. It has no traces to biblical Christianity whatsoever never see Jesus talking about walking prayer labyrinths, teaching his disciples to practice yoga, uh, practice contemplative prayer. Uh, these are all things that don't come from biblical Christianity at all, but are being embraced by the emergent church today because they're looking for some kind of subjective, 
personal encounter with the divine. And so they say that if we can find these kinds of things in other religions, let's borrow these things from other religions and just call them Christian. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. For those uh, who profess to be a part of the evangelical church, they're now introducing the very things, uh, whether it be prayer altars, prayer labyrinths, uh, techniques, bells, incense, candles, all of these things that have a very sensual uh, seduction, but they are not biblical. Many people who are seeking after an experience to participate in Christianity are not interested in studying the Word of God. They say that you know teaching the Bible word by word or verse by verse, that just doesn't work today. What you need is some kind of entertainment. What you need is the experiences that you need to be able to smell God, taste God, feel God, touch God. Rob Bell from Mars Hill Church. He's kind of the rock star of the emergent movement. In his book, Velvet Elvis, he uh, lays out this scenario, if you will. What if we could prove, if it was demonstrable, that Jesus didn't have a heavenly father, but an earthly one. And so he goes and he lays this hypothetical that is a direct attack at the deity of Jesus Christ. And then he posits this question hypothetically, could you not still be a Christian? Could you still not love God? It's all part of his way of, of calling into question what we would consider doctrines. And he makes the point that doctrines are things that should be flexible. And when you start to redefine things that way, no, you can't be a Christian at that point because you're talking about a different Jesus entirely. Those of us that came out of the New Age have a sensitivity to some of the teachings that seem subtle to the world or to the church, but that are very obvious to us. And that's what the church is calling for. They've jettisoned the idea that they can know a theology from God's Word, and they've really tried to know God through practices which God has not ordained and which are actually part of the pagan culture. The early church had its, its uh, struggles. Um, we see Paul talk about a group of people referred to as the Gnostics. They claimed to have understanding and knowledge that was beyond just normal reason. Paul was consistently addressing them because they were infesting the church of his time very much the same way that they are nowadays. Uh, underlying all of that is, is the idea of truth. What is established? What is truth? To the Gnostics, they would say, well, there's your truth and then there's ours, which we know. And it all goes back to uh, experiential. It's a slippery slope when we lead away to embrace all ideas, whether they be cultural relevant or not, if we're moving away from the authority of the word and embracing dogmas, experiences, traditions, or other beliefs that are unbiblical. How does one come to an understanding of knowledge? To a person who believes very, very simply in the teachings of the Bible, we would say that truth is found there. That is ultimate truth because it is God-breathed. When Jesus made the statement in Luke 18 regarding the end times and faith, he said, will the Son of Man find faith when he returns? Biblical faith is trusting and believing what God has said in his word. Faith comes by hearing the word and responding accordingly. All belief systems believe in something. They have faith in something. Um, the Bible speaks of faith in, in much different terms. Our faith is the definite article, the faith, that is different than all the rest, is that Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So that is exclusive of any other belief system anywhere else on the planet. There is no other way to come to God the Father. There is no way to enter heaven aside from through Him, the way, the truth, and the life. That is the faith that we hold to. The author of our faith is the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is the perfecter of our faith. If you want to know the objective truth to believe, then go to the Scriptures. The reason over 90% of the world is being deceived right now is because they're following the messages of men rather than the Word of God. My experience growing up Roman Catholic, if I had a question, there was always one answer and only one answer, because the church says so. So I had to fall back on the, the history of the church, but that wasn't satisfying. But when I was given answers from the Bible, things that I could check out to see if what they were saying was true, that changed my life.
over a period of about four or five months by comparing the Bible and my New Age teachings, my wife and I came to realize that the Bible was totally trustworthy because it described everything that we've been involved in. And it also describes everything that's going on in the church today. There will be few in the last days who will trust in the Word of God. They will have been misled. They will be part of an apostate church. They will believe they're part of the church. They will believe they're professing Christians, but instead they have been misled and they don't even know it. That's what apostasy is. Apostasy and heresy, um, a lot of times they're used inter interchangeably. Uh, the apostasy would be the falling away, if we want to use it in very general terms, uh, meaning that people will, um, will fall away from what has been considered to be settled truth. Heresy will be the things that they, uh, that they hold to in a doctrinal sense that, that contribute to that falling away. What is the greatest evidence of apostasy today? Well, again, if you define apostasy as a departing from the faith, we see throughout Scripture it's not only a departing from the faith, it's departing from the truth, departing from the gospel. Even in Galatians 1, departing from the Lord Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 24, when he was asked, what will be the sign of the end and you're coming. And he said, take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Paul, for example, writing to the church at Corinth said, I'm concerned lest you be deceived as Eve was deceived by the serpent and leave the simple gospel for another gospel because there is another spirit and another Christ. So it's very clear, the one who deceived Eve is the one who deceived the church at Corinth and is the one who's deceiving the church today, leading people away from the Word of God, leading people away from the biblical Jesus for another Jesus because there is another spirit and there's another Christ. Deception is the sign of the end. We are told that evil men will wax worse and worse and that's just the way it is. Jesus doesn't mince his words. He tells us things as they really are. And we're being told to watch out for false prophets and false teachers. And we're watching them right now as they roam around in the church, calling themselves evangelicals when they're really wolves in sheep's clothing. What makes a Christian? It's not the church that you go to. It's not the, the creed or doctrine that you hold to. It's not your education. It's very simply, do you believe what the Bible says? Jesus explains that there needs to be a spiritual rebirth that happens subsequent to your physical birth. And so this idea of knowing who Jesus is personally brings about a spiritual rebirth and it's, it's kind of culminates in what Jesus says in John 3.16. Everybody knows the passage. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe would not perish but have eternal life. I went to seminary uh, to really know and learn more about God's word. I wanted to grow an understanding of their great doctrines of the faith. Uh, but instead, I found out to my disappointment that when I was at seminary, we actually never got over wrangling about whether you could know what was true. And so instead of learning the great truths from God's Word, we never got beyond preliminary issues of arguing and really um, debating whether or not you even know something from God's Word. The seminaries have adopted what they felt was a more sophisticated, a more intelligent, a more enlightened way of interpreting the Bible, which excluded the foundation of the Word of the Bible, the inerrancy of Scripture, the understanding that a sovereign God could communicate His inerrant Word, and that that was our guidebook. When they began gutting it through higher criticism, that is what began to be the foundation of the teaching of the professors and the pastors who were coming out of the seminaries. Well, now they open up Scripture, and Scripture is no longer then the objective Word of God. Scripture is just something that you as an individual or you as a local community or church can now interpret and, and work with to apply to your particular situation. And it might be true in your case or it might not be true in your case. Christians who understand the Word of God as it is written understand the deception that is taking place in our day will intensify, it will get worse. Only the people who are deceived don't even realize they're being deceived. They are actually deluded. One of the most heartbreaking statements that I heard was from a man named Bishop Jim Pike, now deceased. He was the Bishop of California. 
for many years. We knew him personally. He said, as a young agnostic, I believe nothing of the Word of God. And then I became a Christian and I went to seminary. And I went to Union Theological Seminary. And I was left when I graduated with nothing but sand and pebbles. He went to a seminary expecting to find the truth of the Word of God taught. What he was taught instead was a gutted, devalued, irrelevant word that had nothing to do with reality or the God who gave it. Eighty percent of the pastors that are in operations today were not called by God because they don't have a love of the Word of God. Many of these people went to seminaries and to, to theological places that are teaching blasphemy. What they're saying is you can't trust biblical Christianity. You can't trust people who, you know, hold fast to the Word of God. They're dull. They're boring. They're not doing the true faith, which is getting out and helping people. And so they're coming out of seminary and they're, and they're being given positions of authority. And it's really a shame. We look at the evidence of the Ivy League schools. They started off as seminaries. Now they've all drifted into apostasy. We see other seminaries today that are drifting into apostasy. So much of the corruption that's coming into the modern church itself is uh, coming in through the higher learning institutions, through the seminaries and all the rest of it. The things that Jesus taught and the people to whom he taught them and the people who shaped, if you will, what is Christianity never went to a seminary. Most of them were just ordinary people who met an extraordinary man and he changed their lives. Merging church leader Leonard Sweet is the distinguished visiting professor at a number of places like George Fox University in Portland, Oregon. Leonard Sweet, in his book Quantum Spirituality, a Postmodern Apologetic, calls New Age leader Matthew Fox, New Age leader Willis Harmon, and New Age, the late psychiatrist M. Scott Peck, his role models and his heroes. He calls them the new light leaders that have inspired him. In his book, he thanks the shaman of the new age, David Spangler, Leonard Sweet, says that we're in the midst of a great awakening. Who is he kidding? The awakening that's going on is coming from the new age, new spirituality. They're saying that we should awaken to the God that is within us, the God who's already there. And he talks about your inner Jesus. People like C. Peter Wagner of Fuller Seminary, one of their great professors in the field of missiology, brilliant author, and on the field for over, I believe, 30 years, adopted techniques out of the latter reign, which was a movement that started in the 1900s, and through people like William Branham, who was an evangelist in the 1940s and 50s, who had genuine power but it was occultic to the core, and he was teaching aberrant theology. The Apostle Paul says, ever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. That's what's, that's what's happening in the seminaries and the schools. They're learning, and what did Daniel say? In the end days, there will be an increase in knowledge. People think they're getting knowledge here from all these, you know, merging teachers. They're getting, they're getting the deception that Jesus warned us to watch out for. Seminary professors like C. Peter Wagner became exposed to the teachings of the third wave movement that said, we have to have an experience with God. It's not enough just to study the dry old word. We need a new logos, a new word that supersedes the dry old word. As a seminary professor, he's had tremendous impact in raising up young pastors and workers on the mission field who feel the Word of God is okay and that's important, but it's secondary to these new experiences that have opened them up to a lot of the demonic. And we're seeing the result of the doctrines of demons coming out of those seminaries in our churches. It's destroying congregations. Seminaries had a, a, a huge role in the founding of the country, uh, in the equipping of its leadership, um, of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, more than half of them had uh, some kind of seminary uh, background. But what has changed in those was a move away from simple biblical truth that now it's become more of an indoctrination place. Um, we've replaced theology with a lot more psychology. It's no longer about empirical truth, things that we can prove scripturally. It's become much more about opinion. So it gives rise to the whole new uh, liberal theology that, that is uh, is pervading not only the seminaries, but then that spills over into the churches. Immanuel Kant was responsible 
for the philosophy that I ran into in the seminary, really setting the church on the path of not being able to know reality. So what had happened in the seminary that I attended is they gave up on the ability to know truth, which is really foundationalism. That's what the church has built its knowledge base upon. To an emergent, because of the, the beliefs and the teachings of people like Immanuel Kant, uh, you can't know anything absolutely. People like Kant and, and uh, others who continue to purvey that idea that there is no objective absolute truth, when you get right down to it and you apply it to biblical Christianity, the Bible no longer has any kind of authority. The Lord Jesus said the road is narrow that leads to life and very few find it. He goes on to say in Luke that we must strive to enter the narrow gate. Well, the striving there is to search the scriptures, to diligently search the scriptures, to find out whatever teacher you're listening to is a true teacher. The only way we can discern a true leader for the Lord Jesus Christ and a false teacher is to search the scriptures. Because Jesus in that context said, broad is the road that leads to destruction and many are on it. Foundationalism tells you you can know certain things. Um, you, you have a firm foundation to stand on, and because you can stand on that foundation, you can reach up and know other things, including the scriptures themselves. The Immanuel Kant's philosophy that has taken over the seminaries, what it teaches basically is that people can't have access to truth, and therefore they've taken that foundation away. Let's look at his underlying belief, uh, that there is no way to absolutely know anything. Uh, you have to take all things into account experiential and all the other things that churches are dabbling into. The danger with it is that it steals the, the ability of the Bible to arbitrate right and wrong, to have, uh, the, for the Bible to have its way in establishing what is truth. Paul said in the book of Acts, after my departure, there will come wolves in sheep's clothing that will divide the flock. They will seduce the flock into believing that they believe, but instead they've been deceived. Jude said, They've already crept in, and they're among us. They are not of us, but they are among us. So this pattern of deception has clearly been revealed to us in Scripture. It has happened in the past, it is happening today, and it will intensify in the future as the seduction takes place. Every decision that we make, everything that we do, um, in, in some way, directly or, or indirectly, is going to be mentioned in Scripture. It's going to be dealt with. Our, way that we deal with things right and wrong. Everything is, is there. You can find some way to understand it and explain it through Scripture. If we no longer look at it as our authority, then we're the ones who arbitrate what is right and wrong. If that's the case, then we've made God in our own image. The attack by the postmodern age is really on the clarity of Scripture. What they're saying is we can't know what God's Word says. And the reason why they're saying that is because they claim that you and I are too fallible of an interpreter that we can ever come to glean truth from the scriptures. Modern day um, churches, the emergent churches, or however we want to define them, their foundationalism is not anything that is biblical because it's based upon whatever they can all agree upon. That's how they, they approach it. When we look at an overview of the Bible, we see that there has always been an agenda to deceive the world. The Bible says that Satan is the god of this world, the one who deceives the whole world. And so we can see a pattern that has taken place really since the beginning in the Garden of Eden, when Satan came to Eve and said, hath God really said? What happens when there is no longer any kind of authority, then everyone is left to do things for themselves, and they, they leave the idea that God said. The devil's really clever. We, we don't need to give him unnecessary due, but we better pay attention to what he's doing. And we better know his devices. And part of his device right now is to use something that looks cool, but isn't cool. It's not cool to disregard the Bible. Some of the emerging church leaders uh, basically say that we don't want to get involved with, here's a quote, churchy stuff like doctrine. There's a battle out there, but this so-called merging church is not addressing the reality of Satan, him being the god of this world, and the deception that's going on right in front of our eyes. When I flew aircraft as an airline pilot, we relied upon knowing truth every day. 
when air traffic control told us to turn right and to decide to maintain 3,000 feet, uh, we had to turn right and it had to be 3,000 feet. We couldn't do our own thing. The ASIN may give you an instruction to fly at a certain altitude or a certain heading. It's imperative that you follow that instruction. If you uh, fly, the, fly the aircraft to where it should be flown, follow the instructions. In the meantime, if you don't know what the reasons are, that's why they're having you go to a certain altitude or a certain heading. So I guess you to decide what's best for us. What was so dissatisfying about going to seminary was that in the most important aspect of knowledge, with, which I believe is theology, they were telling you that you could go to 4,000 feet, you could turn any direction you wanted, because they took a, away the objective standard, which is God's word. Let's just look at this in, in very practical terms. One of these days we'll stand before God, and we wouldn't even know who he is or anything about his nature had it not been for the Bible. We wouldn't know anything about the person of Jesus other than maybe some obscure bits of history, but it's the Bible that defines who he is. Tells us everything about the, the theology and, and the nature of God and the Holy Spirit, Jesus, his son. All of that is found in scripture. And yet we have those people who want to say that we can't know anything. The danger with that, if there is nothing that is absolute, then everyone is left to do that which is right in their own eyes. There's basically only two worldviews. There's the idea that we are submitted to the Creator God as our authority, as our truth. We trust in Him and His leading and His direction um, becomes our daily walk, if you will. Or the other is rebellion to those thoughts. Satan rebelled against God being his authority and chose to do what was right in his own eyes, to um, have his own truth, to be like God. In Isaiah 14, it says that he saw that there was a monotheistic Most High God, but that he could be like the Most High, therefore introducing the idea that we could all be gods and do whatever was right in our own eyes. My time spent at Saddleback Church, truly believing that I was a good Christian woman, that um, actually I didn't know, I didn't think I was good. I was in such sin and turmoil within, but I really thought that by being a Christian meant going to church and, and um, learning the teachings from Rick Warren. And unfortunately, I didn't know Jesus Christ through those years spent at um, Saddleback. And my heart just goes to so many thousands that are being deceived by that because they don't know who Jesus is. They don't carry the Word of God and I never felt that I was ever forgiven for my sins. It wasn't something that was taught at Rick Warren's church about the forgiveness of sins that I can recall in those nine years. Um, the importance of that is huge with my relationship with the Lord. Now that I have it and I have the Word of God and I have the truth indwelling in me. The only way that God says that we can have salvation, reconciliation with Him, live with Him for eternity is through accepting Jesus Christ, uh, His gift on the cross by grace, by faith, um, seeing that He paid the penalty for sin and that if we believe in that, then none will perish and we will have eternal life, which is why Jesus came to give us salvation for all eternity.